structure. Okay, and as long as you have something that you're comfortable with, it's not going to make a big difference. Okay, and I tend to like to use a DNS name on my internal network that's very similar to my external network. Okay, so in this case here, Ben and Brady's Ice Cream uh, they have a they have a public DNS namespace. Their internet website is hosted at www.benandbrady's.com. So they're going to do the same thing here, and they're going to maintain that same name on their internal network as well. Okay, so we're going to have Ben and Brady.com. Okay, so let's click next. This typically takes a couple seconds here, five, ten seconds or so. But we'll start talking about the next screen, which is going to be the NetBIOS name. Okay, and the NetBIOS name, if you're not familiar with NetBIOS or WinSock, these are application program interfaces. DNS is the new naming structure that's used within Windows 2000. Well, WINS is the old way we did things. We used NetBIOS names and we used the WINS NetBIOS name server to resolve these names to IP addresses. This name here, okay, this domain net BIOS name, this is allowing backwards clients or legacy clients such as Windows 95, Windows 98, or NT 4.0 to have a way to connect to this actual domain. Okay, so we're going to specify Ben and Brady here, and you can change this. If you wanted to, you could change this to anything you want, but I recommend against it. By changing this name, you'd have a different DNS name. Keep in mind, previously we had benandbrady.com than you would your NetBIOS name. So some people would refer to this domain as benandbrady.com and other people would refer to the other name that you chose to name this domain. Okay, so this name is limited to 15 characters. In this case here, the default name that they come up with is less than 15 characters so we don't run into any problems here. So we're going to accept the default and we're going to click Next. Okay, here we get to specify where the Active Directory database is going to be located and also where the Active Directory log file is. Okay, and as it says up here for best performance and recoverability, store the database and log on separate hard disks. So it's a good idea that we store these on a separate physical drive, not partition, that's not going to help us out, but literally a separate physical hard drive. In our case, you know, on this system here, there's only one physical hard drive, so it's not going to make a big difference. We're going to leave the default location where it is. And please be aware of where that default location is. This is something that's you know, very important. You need to go back in, check to make sure the Active Directory database was, was indeed copied there after this is done. So make a note of this. C colon backslash WinNT is the default um, installation folder that Windows 2000 is installed in. So if you installed into a different folder or a different partition, this default would be different as well. Okay? Windows 2000 on my system was installed on the C drive in the WinNT folder. So this is the default location of both the database and the log. And we're going to leave that for this lab. The sysfile folder. Okay, once again, the sysfile folder's default location is also within the WinNT directory. Okay, and the important thing about the sysfile folder, are several things that we need to talk about with it. Number one is what it says right here. The sysfile volume or sysfile folder must be located on an NTFS version 5 volume. Okay, so it must be located on a volume within Windows 2000 that's been formatted with NTFS. If you don't have that, you're not going to be able to uh, install the sysfile folder. Now, the sysfile folder is a new feature to Windows 2000 that allows us to copy um, group policies, log on scripts, all different sorts of things, and any domain control that we install within our network automatically has a sysfile folder. The nice thing about the sysfile folder is it sets up automatic replication between the two different domain controllers. And I'm not talking about Active Directory here. You know, the Active Directory database is a different thing. That, of course, is going to replicate between different domain controllers. What I'm talking about here at the sysfile folder is just a folder location where if I place a file or a folder into it, that file or folder is going to be automatically replicated to the other domain controllers on my network. Okay, this is very convenient for things like login scripts. Okay, and you may not be familiar with the login script. The login script you want this to run for every user when they first log on to the network to map network drives or maybe map some printers. Now if it's only located on one domain controller, a user may not get that login script if they end up logging on to a different domain controller. Well with the sysfile folder automatically replicating, that's going to ensure that that file, that login script, is copied over to every different domain controller, which can be very beneficial when you're trying to you know, set up a efficient, optimized network. 
Okay, so we move forward here. And here's another important little message that comes up. Okay, and this message here is letting us know that the DNS server cannot be contacted and Active Directory is very dependent upon DNS and this could be an issue. Okay, and in most cases, if I'm configuring a production server, okay, meaning if, if I'm sitting down in a company and I want to install Windows 2000, uh, a domain controller for them, I'm not going to see this message because I'm going to have taken care of Active Directory uh, DNS ahead of time. Okay, I'm going to configure DNS ahead of time. I wanted to make sure that you see this message though and get a feeling for what it means. It doesn't mean it's not going to work. It just means right now DNS is not installed and Active Directory really, really needs DNS to work. Okay, so we have a couple choices here. No, I will install and configure DNS myself. You can choose this option. If you go through this way and then reboot your server, Active Directory is not going to function correctly, and if you don't ever install DNS, your Active Directory is, you know, never going to function correctly. You can choose this top option here. Yes, install and configure DNS on this computer. Once it gets done, though, and your system reboots after Active Directory is installed, it's imperative that you go back into the system and make sure that you configure DNS correctly. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and choose this top option here. Yes, install and configure DNS on this computer. For some reason, it just kind of throws DNS onto the system uh, in a half-hearted manner. It's not really uh, fully configured. Okay, so when we boot the system back up after installing Active Directory, we're going to open up DNS and take a closer look at what you need to do. But as I mentioned, you know, it's a real good idea to set up DNS ahead of time, get it configured, and if you have that set up ahead of time and working correctly, then you won't get that error message that we saw previously. Okay, so we're going to leave this selected, yes, install and configure DNS on this computer, and then we'll select next. This next screen we see here, we have the choice of choosing permissions compatible with pre-Windows 2000 servers or permissions compatible with only Windows 2000 servers. Now this top choice here is obviously letting, loosening up the security a little bit. Okay, and, and this is necessary if we have NT 4.0 remote access servers. An NT 4.0 remote access server is a server that's allowing somebody, a user, to dial in to the company's network, okay, or virtual private network into the company's network. So if you have NT 4.0 servers, this may be an issue for you, and you, you may want to select